And I want to welcome all the attendees who have tuned in to uh, our Facebook page to attend our virtual uh, town hall today on COVID-19 and the efforts we're making to uh, make life better and to make everything safer. Uh, it's been a, almost a year, it'll be a year Thursday, since we've kind of started to go into the shock of lockdown. We had a little bit of it, we came into it, but it was a, a year ago on Thursday, March 11th, and President Biden will uh, note that in an address to the nation on Thursday night, March 11th. Uh, been a while, we've been in homes, we've been sheltered, we've lived a, a abnormal life, not a normal life, and been wearing masks, sheltering in place, and washing our hands, et cetera. Um, we have to continue with that, even though things are better. We've lost over a half million lives in America to COVID-19, and we've lost way too many in Memphis, where we have a lot of uh, frontline workers uh, who have had to go to work and protect us, and who have uh, had comorbidities. Uh, most uh, probably the worst has been diabetes and obesity that has caused a, a more death in the African-American community than in the general populace percentage-wise. And that's a fact that we have to take note of and try to uh, um, resolve the best we can with the distribution of vaccines. Uh, we have been working on in Congress on providing funding and programs to fight this pandemic. We passed several bipartisan CARES Acts uh, that brought testing and tracing uh, to the communities and that brought relief for businesses with the PPP, uh, put a lot of businesses, save businesses from going out, 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 of, out of business, directed toward giving employees pay, we extended unemployment insurance, which kept people alive and, and able to, to uh, survive during this pandemic when many people lost their jobs. And we've had uh, provided PPE uh, equipment that the frontline workers needed and others needed to be safe. So lots of uh, efforts and continue to do it. We just last week, the Senate on Saturday, the House last week, passed the uh, HEROES Act, which uh, does extension of getting shots in arms, more vaccines out there, more testing, more tracing, um, more PPP for economic recovery, uh, stimulus checks, uh, $1,400 to go with the $600 we earlier had to make for $2,000 to families with uh, in, well, singles with family incomes of $75,000, marrieds with $150,000, and then it gets phased out at $80,000 for a single and $160,000 for a married couple. There is a, that $1,400 is for each person in the family, not just the, the husband and wife or the head of household, but also children in the household. Uh, and, and the unemployment has continued at $300 in the Senate bill, which the House will accept that amendment. And it will go to September the 6th. It otherwise expires March 14th. And that's our deadline to make sure the people who are unemployed continue to get their, their checks and can bring, have some money in the house. Uh, to combat the virus, the HEROES Act will make sure we have enough vaccines for all, all Americans through research, development, manufacturing, production, and purchase. Uh, we want to get those vaccines out as quickly as possible. And ECHO will be through the community with mobile vaccination sites and other ways to get them into the community. At Memphis, we've uh, seen Federal Express as well as uh, UPS do the massive jobs of distributing the vaccines around the country. And locally, we've seen uh, the city government kind of come to the rescue to streamline our plans. And, and it's Kroger and certain uh, uh, drug stores, and, and, and I think Walmart too, come in and, and make the vaccine more available. So things are getting better and they will continue to improve as, as we go on. Mayor Strickland has pledged a certain number of uh, vaccines for a certain number of time, and I feel sure he'll get that. Just as President Biden promised 100,000 shots in arms in 100 days, he's going to surpass that easily. Uh, we have to improve communication to strengthen confidence in the vaccine and make sure all Americans know when, where, and how to get the vaccine. We'll scale up testing and tracing, which is necessary to address shortage of, of personal protective equipment and other critical supplies and invest in high quality treatments and address healthcare disparities. And although we're trying to get everyone vaccinated as soon as possible, there are some who are hesitant to take this vaccine. Uh, for anyone deliberating, you're right to think carefully and critically about your health and safety and about any vaccine or, or medical treatment you take as health and safety of your family and community is, is a, uh, a prime 
uh, consideration and, and naturally uh, you need to look at that with an um, educated eye. These vaccines are new and I understand that many have their doubts and questions about them. I also understand that some may distrust the government and medical establishment, particularly in the African-American community, which historically has been abused and mistreated by this country's healthcare providers and, and medical research. And that's understood, but in many ways they've been mistreated and underserved today. Uh, I personally have gotten the vaccine, taken both shots, got it as soon as I could, and I encourage everyone to do that. Uh, a primary reason for putting this panel together of distinguished uh, scholars is to discuss the matters openly and frankly, to address the racial health disparities pre COVID 19. Uh, and, and disparities have been exaggerated in the seen it with the outcomes, and for all uh, of us, myself included, to gain a better understanding of the COVID-19 vaccine by getting credible scientific medical information that we can trust. Tonight, we're going to hear from uh, uh, six particular individuals. Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, who is the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Webb Hooper uh, this is one of my favorite groups, the National Institute of Health. I always say they're our true Department of Defense because our real enemy is disease. And she's there fighting disease. So thank you for being our, our, in the Department of Defense there. Uh, Dr. Collins is one of my favorites. He's a star. Dr. James E.K. Hildren is with us, an infectious disease expert and president of Mary Medical College. He's on the president's COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. And he sat on the FDA advisory panel that recommended the emergency use authorization of both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Dr. Jeff Warren is with us. He's a family medicine doctor. He's a Memphis City Councilman. He's a council representative for the Memphis and Shelby County COVID-19 Joint Task Force. And he's my doctor and my friend. Dr. Manoj Chain is an infectious disease physician at Baptist Hospital and Methodist Hospitals of Memphis, a clinical associate professor at UT Memphis and Emory University an advisor for the Memphis and Shelby County COVID-19 Task Force, also a friend and a distinguished uh, expert who's been published in the Washington Post and many national publications. And Ms. Tiffany Collins is with us. She's Deputy Director of the General Services Division, City of Memphis, that is leading the distribution of vaccines in our uh, district, in our city, and then overall. So I'm going to give each panelist an opportunity to introduce themselves, and then I'll ask some questions that have been submitted to us by you the citizens. First, Dr. Webb, if you'd like to start. Sure. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, um, Congressman Cohen. I'm delighted to be with everyone today, and I thank you for the invitation. I'm actually Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, we have an amazing director, but thank you for the promotion. Um, it is one of the NIH institutes, and it's the one whose mission and primary responsibility is to work across NIH and the Department of Health and Human Services more generally to advance the science aiming to improve the health of minoritized populations, reduce health disparities and move us closer to meaningful progress towards health equity. And we know that this pandemic has disproportionately affected um, African-Americans, American Indians or Alaska Native persons um, and also Hispanic and Latino individuals. And I think the important point about health disparities is, is that these are differences that do not have to exist. They should not exist. They are modifiable. And that means that we have the opportunity for change. And at NIH, we are focused on the science response to COVID-19. And we've been working tirelessly to do so with a specific focus on meeting the needs of underserved communities. And I think this recognition instigated by COVID-19 has inspired a refocus on community engaged research. That is working with the affected communities to develop, execute and evaluate interventions that resonate the needs. Let me just say a couple of things about COVID-19 vac vaccines. So we know that we now have three vaccines that have been granted emergency use authorization by the FDA. And we know that while some of us are very excited about getting vaccinated against COVID-19, that not everyone is quite there. Um, there is skepticism about accepting the vaccine and it's in part because 
of the infodemic that we're experiencing. And the infodemic, which you know is a blend of the words information and epidemic, it's a rapid and a far reaching spread of this combination of both accurate and also inaccurate information. And it makes it really hard to separate what's fact and what's fiction and to have confidence in a solution. We know that there are so many conspiracy theories out here. And the concern about this infodemic for COVID-19 is that it may have a particularly adverse impact on the communities who are most affected. And the NIH is working on this. We have um, an initiative called SEAL, which is the Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. We have a website. I encourage you to look at it for accurate information about COVID-19, about vaccine trials, vaccine development, and it has commonly asked questions. I'll mention the website. It's covid19community.nih.gov. That's covid19community.nih.gov. And, you know, SEAL is established with the ground game to address misinformation, to do what we're doing now, which is engaging trusted voices to lead conversations, people who can offer scientific perspectives, but doing so in a, in a bi-directional community engagement way so that we're not just talking at people, but we're listening and we're hearing the messages. And I'm excited that there are three vaccines available. And I, I also strongly encourage everyone to review the phases of vaccine distribution in your state or city or district and find out when and where you can receive it. Um, I think we also need to really lean in and help our relatives and friends who may not be as active on the internet to navigate the websites to get an appointment, which can be quite competitive, or to help call their providers to ask. And if they don't have providers, help them by calling the nearest hospital or health center to ask the questions. So I'm delighted to be here and happy to uh, contribute further to the conversation as we move along. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Webb Hooper, and I'm sure you'll get that promotion soon. <laughs> Dr. Hildreth is uh, next to address us, Dr. James E.K. Hildreth from Maharia. Congressman Cohen, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this important conversation. Uh, I've been studying viruses since 1978, and I had the privilege of sitting on the FDA panel that reviewed all of the data for these three vaccines. There's likely to be a fourth vaccine in the near future. And, you know, when you think about the fact that the genome for the virus was published on January the 6th or 10th of 2020, to be injecting arms with two safe vaccines in December of the same year has to be considered one of the great scientific achievements of our time. And what I want people to know is that none of the steps required to ensure safety of these vaccines were omitted. They're all subjected to a rigorous clinical evaluation, scientific evaluation involving tens of thousands of people to make sure they're safe and effective. And it is now up to all of us to make sure that all of us in the community have the information they need to feel empowered to make the right decision. And the right decision is to be vaccinated, not just to protect ourselves, but our communities and our families. And people need to do so. I think the other thing I think that's very important is there's another ongoing pandemic, HIV AIDS, which is still with us. And COVID-19 and AIDS, HIV AIDS have certain parallels that must not be uh, forgotten. One of which is that both of these have shown us over a period of 40 years, four decades, just how wide the chasm is in the health status of people of color in this country. And I'm really hoping that one of the lasting uh, consequences of living through the last year and getting through it will be that the states the country takes definitive steps to make sure the next pandemic, and there will be a next pandemic, does not have the same burden of disease on people of color that this one does. So thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, conversation. I hope I can illuminate the science for those that are tuned in. Thank you. Dr. Hilbert, thank you. And thank you for being on our great uh, Meharry Medical Institute. We appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Warren is next. Memphian, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, I've been a family physician in Memphis uh, for years and years, and actually in my internship at Columbia, I started out when uh, HIV was called GRID, and we had a number of gay men in New York City that were coming into Columbia Presbyterian Hospital and dying. 
Uh, no one knew what it was. It was scary. It was a pandemic. Uh, people uh, had the same sort of reaction. I think we see now with COVID where people overreacted with ignorance until we were able to get to science and understand how we treated this disease. Um, I am very concerned uh, about what I hear from some of my patients and my practice and fellow workers, co-workers in the health uh, field about how the Tuskegee uh, Institute uh, experimentation has continued to uh, make communities of color, African-Americans particularly, very leery of the healthcare establishment and what's going on. And I try to tell people that in that particular experiment, they withheld treatment and damaged people's lives and you know were inhumane. But now if we don't take advantage of the science that Dr. Hildreth was talking about and use this to protect African-American lives, we're going to see further loss, and those same racists who did that experiment are going to win again, and more African American people are going to die needlessly. So I think it's very important as we talk tonight, we answer questions about how this virus and this vaccine came about and why it is safe. And what the reason that it came about so quickly was not that they rushed things, but that the science was so much better. Uh, uh, if you're looking at why you get a booster at three and four weeks, it has nothing to do with science. That's how they could do the scientific safety studies and get the vaccine out more rapidly instead of waiting two to four to six months for the booster shot. So um, uh, with that being said, I, I'm looking forward to this and uh, to further discussions and answering our constituents' questions. Thank you, Congressman. You're welcome, Jeff, and thank you. Ms. Collins, Ms. Tiffany Collins, who's got the job to get it all delivered, get it here as on. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Congressman. Um, it's been about a year since we've been dealing with the effects of COVID-19. And from the beginning, the city of Memphis has taken a very active role in every aspect of housing assistance, utility services, meal delivery for children um, when um, school was unceremoniously ended. Um, and we went on to testing, uh, testing in schools, community testing, and making sure that it was as accessible as possible, that it was free, and that it was quick and efficient. And now we have moved into the role of vaccine distribution, and we plan to take on that same approach, making sure that those who want to be vaccinated can be vaccinated in a quick and efficient and healthy manner and that it is accessible to them in their communities and that it is smooth and we continue and hopefully at some point we will uh, be on the other side of this, but we'll continue to take a leadership role in Memphis and in Shelby County to make sure that we're all healthier. Thank you for having me again. You're welcome and thank you for being with us. Uh, Dr. Jane, you are uh, our, our pro from Dover and uh, you're gonna clean us up right here. Well, oh, wonderful. Thank you, Congressman, and delighted to be here. Um, uh, you know, a, a decade ago, I was asked by the CEO of the hospital at an infection control committee meeting, Dr. Jane, what keeps you up at night? And the avian flu was going on at night at that time. And I clearly remember I said this, if there was a virus which was more transmissible than the flu and there was a virus, which killed more people than the flu, that would keep me awake at night. And I tell you, I am not sleeping well. Uh, that is what is really concerning. So let us just take about three to five minutes and talk about what is the vaccine and what it can do, and also a bit about masking. You really have to think about the vaccine as an immune booster. So what is our immune system? Very simply, it's red cells and white cells. And when you take those white cells, they are called B cells and T cells. And if we have the next slide. I think you can go to the next slide. Yes. And this is a cartoon of the virus. You see those red things, that's called the spike protein. And inside the virus are the RNA that determine what the, uh, the uh, uh, protein and the coatings are. What scientists did was basically take that red part, which is the spike protein, put it into 
a virus particle and put it into the vaccine. And that's what mRNA is. And it's really not the entire virus at all. And next slide shows basically how it works in our immune system. That virus is put in into our, we get injected with it and our cells make those red uh, spike proteins, which are and our uh, immune cells recognize and they make what we call antibodies, those Y-shaped uh, uh, particles, protein particles, and that's what protects us. So next slide, what you see is basically, if you get infected with a virus, those antibodies are ready and prepared to attack that virus and to get it out of our system. Next slide. Now, what's really important to know is how effective this vaccine is. So this is a slide from the Pfizer study and look at the days that uh, it has been studied for. So 90 to 112 days. And there's a red line of people who got the vaccine and the blue line of people who got the placebo, not the vaccine. What you can see is after blown up in the graphic above is after the 12th day, there was significant protection. Anyone who was on the uh, vaccine line was not getting infected. Anyone who was on the blue line, you kept getting infected more and more. Honestly, you want to be on the vaccine line. And that is what shows the effectiveness. Next slide. Now the people ask, we have a menu of vaccines and it gets really complicated even with the variants. So you have the Pfizer vaccine, you have the Moderna vaccine, uh, and now we have the Johnson and Johnson. Essentially what we need to keep in mind is all of them have over 80 to 100% protection against severe disease. That's what we wanna avoid. If you want to protect yourself, you don't wanna be hospitalized, vaccine is the best way. And also the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and other vaccines work against the UK variant. Not as well for the South African, and we can talk more about that, but for the UK, which is the prominent one, it works really well. And next slide, as I finish up, uh, what's important to remember is the protecting is uh, from the vaccine, but also protecting from masking. And that's one of the best ways to protect ourselves. So I have worked with the World Health Organization and I worked with the World Bank. And I can tell you, no one in the, on earth has seen what has uh, transpired before. We need to protect ourselves with vaccination, masking and distance. Thank you, Congressman. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of our panelists. I'd now, now like to ask some questions uh, of, of each member of the panel. Uh, and they've been co collected from our constituents. And I'll kick off the conversation with Dr. Hildreth. Uh, the first question, Dr. Hildreth, as a member of FDA's advisory panel, what can you say about the vaccine trials and the data regarding vaccine efficacy and safety? There are just a few things I would highlight uh, about the trials. All of the trials that have been come before FDA so far have involved tens of thousands of participants. The basic design is that 10, 15,000 to 20,000 people get the vaccine candidate, 15,000 to 20,000 get the placebo. We wait until 150 infections have occurred. We then look to see in which group the infections have occurred. And what you like to see is that the infections occur in the placebo group, but not in the vaccine group. And that's how you know that the vaccine has worked. Uh, the studies were done in a very rigorous fashion. Uh, people were asked to monitor themselves for seven days after each of the injections to see what the local reactions were going to be. Uh, the vaccines were well tolerated, proved to be very safe. And as you've heard, all of them, all three of them, give complete protection against hospitalization and death, which is what we'd like to, what we'd like to see. One thing that we must not let happen is we must not let the narrative take hold that the J&J &J vaccine is a less of a vaccine than the Moderna and Pfizer. The J&J &J vaccine offers 85% protection against severe disease, but it also, again, offers 100% protection against hospitalization and death. 
So what I'd like people to know is that they were subjected to a rigorous evaluation on three continents with tens of thousands of participants. And these vaccines are safe and effective and all of us should have confidence in taking them. Thank you, doctor. Uh, and it's good you brought up the, the J and J. Anytime you get a vaccine, you recommend get taking it and getting whichever that is, is available? Whichever vaccine becomes available to you first is the one that you should take. I got the Moderna vaccine, but that was the one that was available to me at the time. If the J and J vaccine were the only one that was available to me back in December, that's the one I would have taken. Uh, so I hope people don't let this notion get in their minds that the J and J vaccine is a lesser than vaccine because it has a very important role to play. It can be refrigerated for a long, long time. It can be stored frozen for two years. It's one shot. So this vaccine is much more conducive to pop-up vaccination centers where people cannot come back for a second shot. So it has a, a great place in our war chest to fight, the, to fight the virus. We must utilize it as soon as we can. Dr. Jane mentioned how this vaccine was developed very quickly and that's a tribute to science, but some people still are concerned whether that makes it unsafe uh, and, and if there are any side effects, including long-term effects. Dr. Hildreth, Dr. Jane, uh, any, any long side effects or long-term effects? Can I speak to the speed of development of the vaccines first? Please. And I'll let Dr. So here's what uh, people should know. None of the steps required to establish the safety of a vaccine was omitted in this case. There are three major reasons I'd like people to know that the vaccines were developed so quickly. The first is technology. Technologies were brought to bear on COVID-19, the likes of which we'd not ever seen before. Let me give you one example. Normally it takes a year or two to identify a vaccine candidate once we've characterized the virus. The genome for SARS-CoV-2 was published on January the 10th. Less than a month later, three companies had already identified vaccine candidates. So a process that normally takes two years was done in a month because technologies were brought to bear that we'd not had before. The second one is vaccine development is normally an iterative process. You do one step, you follow that by another step, followed by another step. The resources were made available to the companies to allow those steps to be done in parallel. So rather than having an extended period of development, because the steps were done in parallel, that significantly compressed the time scale. The third thing is for the last 30 years, we've been trying to develop an HIV vaccine without success. But with, even without having success in developing the vaccine, we've developed a global infrastructure for vaccine development that's robust and quite significant. So what happened in last February and March was the HIV vaccine infrastructure was asked to be put on pause and that was devoted to COVID-19. So amazing technologies, parallel processes and a pre-existing infrastructure are three major factors that allowed us to make vaccines in 10 months rather than four years, which is the quickest vaccine on record. So that's why people should understand that vaccines were developed so quickly. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Jane? Uh, any side effects or long-term effects with the vaccines? So um, the vaccines are very safe. There have lots of studies that, that have looked at and uh, thousands of patients have uh, had the vaccine. And we know that in the short term, the worst thing that happens is a sore arm, maybe achy feeling, of, but that really means that the vaccine is working. Um, you know, over time, we will look at the benefits uh, of the vaccine as well. So from what we know, and from what we know about the vaccines uh, in terms of the mRNA vaccine as well, it is very safe. And more importantly, it is very effective. It works. Uh, I'll, I'll share a story uh, at well, one of our, our hospitals. We can see the number of healthcare workers who are getting sick just decline day by day, as the number of vaccinations were increasing. Take another story of a country like Israel, uh, where they have vaccinated over 90% of their elderly population. And the number of cases have literally vanished in that age group. So we know that the safety is there and we know the efficacy is there as well. So well we Dr. Can I just add one more thing? Yes, yes please. please. 
So as we sit and speak now, more than 200 million people in total have been injected with one of these three vaccines. And the most uh, adverse reaction is a severe allergic reaction that's occurring in one in four million to one in six million shots. And the advice is that if you've had a severe allergic reaction to anything, you should still get the vaccine, but get it in the setting where if you have a reaction, it can be treated very quickly. And most of the vaccination sites have licensed healthcare professionals who can do that. So hundreds of millions of people inject it and the, the most severe adverse reaction is a severe allergic reaction, but those are managed well and, and no one so far, as far as I know, a death has been attributed to the vaccine itself. So these vaccines are extremely safe. Do we know yet if uh, this will be like the flu vaccine and we're gonna be getting these on an annual basis or how long the vaccine will be effective? The truth is that we don't know that yet, but I can tell you that, for example, the measles vaccine gives you protection for life. It does that because it invokes a large number of what we call memory cells. Memory cells stay with us for an extended period of time, and they're the ones that confer long-term memory. If you look at the immunology data from the, the trial of these three vaccines, especially the Moderna and Pfizer with the booster shot, large numbers of memory cells are being generated. So the expectation is that the, mem that the immunity will be long lasting, but that's yet to be determined. So we just don't know, but there's an indication that the, that the immunity will be long lasting. Dr. Webb Hooper, there were uh, a representative number of racial minorities in the vaccine trials, I imagine. Well, that's a, a good question. And it's something that certainly has been the focus and high interest to NIH and all those involved in Operation Warp Speed. Um, and I can say that um, these trials, the numbers are actually quite good, especially, I think they're at least respectable relative to typical uh, trials, clinical trials in general. Uh, Moderna's trial with about a little over 30,000 participants, 10%, 10.2% uh, identified as Black or African American, 20.5% identified as Hispanic or Latino. In the Pfizer trial with over 43,000 participants, a uh, little over 9% identified as Black or African American and 28% as Hispanic or Latino. And in the, the Johnson trial, which has over 40,000 participants, 47% of whom are in the United States, 19% identified as Black or African American. Um, and you know these numbers are actually quite good and we're, we're pleased with them. The other thing about the numbers I'd say is that they provided enough of a sample size, enough people to conduct subgroup analyses, which they did, and did not find any differences in the effectiveness of the vaccine according to racial ethnic group. And I wouldn't have expected that that would be the case, but it's important just to confirm that that, that was not um, a factor in terms of the effectiveness. They were equally effective across groups. So that's very positive news. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Chang, we hear a lot about variants. Uh, scary things like the Brazilian variant and the, we don't have a Zamudian variant yet, but there's English, there's South African, there's uh, Brazilian, uh, their vaccines may be less effective against them. What can you share with us about the variants and what would you say to people who prefer to wait to get vaccinated until we know more about the different variants? So I'll answer the second part first, which is don't wait. Let's talk a little bit about the variants. Um, to put it into perspective, uh, the mRNA uh, in the virus mutates. That's in actually the nature. Every new virus is a little bit different than the previous one. But we really worry when it causes greater transmission, as we talked about, what keeps me up at night. If there's a virus which is more transmissible, then we worry. If there's a virus which kills more people, then we worry. Well these mutations are making these new viruses. And the reason new viruses are being developed uh, in, by, by the natural selection is because they are more transmissible, meaning they're spreading faster or they're killing uh, more folks. So the UK variant is the one that is going to be the one that's moving in our community the most. The good thing is our vaccines work against that variant. So we do not need to fear that the vaccines will not be effective. The other vaccines uh, are showing that 
antibody studies may not be as protective against the variants, but against severe disease and death, they are showing a lot of protection. So the bottom line is the vaccines are very effective uh, in against these variants. Waiting will not be a good idea. Why? Because then you're likely to get infected by the original virus or the variant. So any vaccine you can get, I would say, let's do it. Dr. Hildreth, member of the Biden Task Force, can you tell us more about the national vaccine program? What measures are being taken both at the federal and the state level to boost vaccine distribution and to ensure vaccines get to people of color, low individuals, uh, and other underserved population? So Congressman Cohen, the most important thing that, that uh, I think has happened under President Biden is to improve the supply of vaccines. That's been the concern from the beginning. And the reason why we had to prioritize different groups to receive the vaccine was because of limited supply. So the single most important thing that has happened is to address the supply issue. And we now know uh, that especially with Merck agreeing to make the, help make the vaccine from J&J, &J, that is very likely that by the end of May, all the adults in the country who want the vaccine can get it. And that's gonna help us a great deal. But part of the, the plan that's being implemented across the country is for health departments to partner with local organizations and retail outfits to make sure that we can take the vaccine to the community where people cannot necessarily come to where the vaccine is being offered. Because two significant problems that we're seeing in low income communities and minority communities is A, some of them don't have access to the internet. And as you know, the internet has been used now for web-based platforms to get appointments. A lot of people don't have access to the internet and they don't have facility with using these web-based platforms. So that's been a problem. The other problem that's, that's been significant is actually having transportation to get to where the vaccines are being offered. So a big part of the plan is to identify local community organizations, as Ms. Collins pointed out earlier, that can be uh, engage our communities because they're trusted by our communities to make sure the vaccine gets where they need to get to. So I think that's a big part of the plan. But the biggest <laughs> development so far is to boost the supply of vaccines so that people who need them can get them. Thank you, doctor. Ms. Collins, you're on the local level and you've got the job of getting these shots in people's arms. What's going on here in Memphis to make sure the vaccine gets out, gets uh, expand the distribution to all the communities in Memphis and Shelby County? Absolutely. Um, so with our current allocation from the state, we have 40,000 first and second dose of shots available. And that's through the city of Memphis, public points of distribution, hospitals, uh, local clinics, and pharmacies. With that being said, we've taken over this process. It's been not quite two weeks yet. And what we've decided to do with the support of the state of Tennessee is keep open the 222 shot. And the state is going to back up that line with hundreds of call takers. So that will address some of the equity issues in, as it relates to internet accessibility. We also um, have had over 120 requests from churches, local organizations, employers, and we're vetting those and looking at the different zip codes to make sure that we can address those people where we don't have large points of distribution. And also to um, the gentleman's point, also to people who don't have transportation, we're working with other uh, groups to have strike teams. We have uh, medical programs within our fire department. So um, we've looked at this, realized that there's a lot of opportunity. We'll continue to make sure that we have tens of thousands shots available. And then for those um, who need some additional assistance, we'll make sure that there's an allocation and a resource to get those shots out to them. Is there a number of people should have to call for appointments or to get a, 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 a transportation facilitation? Absolutely. So you can still use the 222 shot number. That number is still going to be available. Uh, we're just going to have a different entity taking those calls to alleviate long wait times and to make sure people get the information they need. In the meantime, the city is actually working on a program to make sure that there is a transportation disparity, whether it's through uh, MATA or if we are just looking to make sure that we address those communities, make sure people don't have to travel across town. We're working on those 
Um, it's been a very interesting week and a half for us in the, the distribution space, <laughs> uh, but those are things that are uh, top of mind to us. But will we have mobile vans going into the communities and will we have shots at, at uh, churches and, and, and community groups like that, community spots? So we are looking at churches. We want to make sure that we address churches that are in spaces that we actually don't already have a large distribution, distribution point. And from that, we are going to allow those churches to do their own outreach so they can garner the members of their community and those within their congregation that may need to hear, come get a vaccine from a trusted source that's not a doctor or a political figure that they have never interacted with. So um, those are on the line. We had some last weekend, there's some coming up this weekend. And I expect until we get to where everyone who wants to be vaccinated is vaccinated, we'll continue to have uh, pop-up pods throughout the weeks. We've heard stories about the end of the day and that some of the centers have vaccine left over after they've vaccinated as people who've come and had their appointments. Is there still an opportunity for people to call the locations at the end of the day to possibly kind of get in at the last minute and get a shot? That is still a possibility. I would tell you in the best case scenario, you don't have leftover shots. Uh, with the city, what we're working to do is when you say leftover shots, that means that, and any of the doctors on the line can jump in, it means it's already been drawn up. So if you are um, diligent about watching your appointments and no-shows, um, that will help you not have any excess or waste. And that's where we are. We've done a pretty good job of that. And uh, what we would hope is that all of the appointments are filled because that helps us gauge how many more second, first and second doses need to get out in the community to people, particularly with second dose shots. Um, so they're I'm quite confident that there's, you know, someone may go somewhere and not even a city ranch location, but there's a, an extra dose available. Um, that is highly possible, but it is not the direction that we would like to go in operationally. And before I turn to Dr. Warren, I know there's the Appling Road and there's, there's the Pipkin. Those are the two most famous uh, centers. Uh, where else is, is, the, is the vaccine available? Is it at, at, at Walmart, Kroger, where? Well, the, the Walmart, the big box retailers receive their allocation directly from the state. And we're working on making sure that people can identify the Walmarts, Walgreens, Kroger, there have you to get a vaccine. It relates to the city's partnerships. We have um, Southwest Community College. We're ongoing that partnership in Whitehaven. There is um, a point of distribution in Raleigh at the Greater Monty Church. Of course, you mentioned Appling, which is in Cordova, and uh, App, uh, Pipkin, which is in Midtown. In addition to that, because we are in Shelby County, there's also a um, distribution point at the Germantown Baptist Church for um, Germantown and Cardiville. Thank you. Dr. Warren, aside from vaccines, what other measures is the city taking to slow the spread of COVID-19? I think one of the things that we've done is we've held tight and fast with our mask ordinance and just the basic message that even though it's looking better, we're not completely through this yet. I think we've been getting the word out that although we've seen a decline in cases, we still have a very high base level of cases in the city. And if one of these variants, such as the B117 British variant, actually takes hold and begins to infect more and more people, we could see another bump or another, you know, rise in hospitalizations and ICU care and death. So what we're trying to get people to do is to realize, even if you've had your vaccine, you still could get infected. It's, and the vaccine's 95% effective. That means one in 20 people who've had it still could get infected. The good news is those people probably are not going to die from it because the vaccines are about 100% effective in keeping people from dying. So what we've done as a city is we tried to make sure we're, we're letting people know to keep their social distancing, be careful when you go in crowds, one of the key things to think about is if you're going to a place where you can't control the number of people around you, that is a time to double mask. Uh, we already know mask work, double mask work even better. Uh, and if you're in a position where you don't know who's going to be coming around the corner, 
And if they have their mask below their nose and you have a double mask, it gives you a lot more protection. So we're trying to stress that. The other thing uh, that was asked a little bit earlier that I think is going to be interesting further on is, you know, this, these mutations occur because we have such a high level of virus in, the, in our communities. And that means there's more and more replications, which means more chances for mutation. Well, if we can get the total level down, then the chances of these mutants coming and harming us are going to be less. Even still, the current technology that was used to develop these vaccines can very quickly be used to develop a vaccine for a variant, much like we check for which flu strain we think is going to come around the next year, and we make our vaccine based on that. These vaccines are going to be so much more effective than that because they'll be able to target whatever variant may be coming and causing more troubles, and they can get them up into production more rapidly because of the technique that Dr. Hildreth talked about and Dr. Jane mentioned about how they're making these occur. So as a city, what we're looking at is building more, getting more pop-ups to get the vaccine out. We're really anxiously awaiting uh, the J&J &J vaccine, which is the one-shot vaccine. Uh, I've, I've talked to uh, the head of our fire department who's uh, running uh, the operations aspect of trying to get the vaccine out. And they're looking at how they can possibly have uh, fire crews, uh, you know, go out and be pop-up uh, vaccination sites at various places in the city that need them. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Collins and her organization are working to try to see how we can get vaccinations out to our homeless population. And again, you know, uh, in this last cold spell, when we had to put people in shelters, we, we made sure we kept people spaced and looked at appropriate spacing and hygiene. So that's what the city's doing as far as trying to limit spread further. But we all have our part to play. This is not the city doing it. It's us doing it with the city and the city providing us the ability to do it well. And I've been very, very proud of what uh, the, city, uh, the city has been able to do with the vaccine. And I do believe we'll be able to give 30 to 50,000 shots a week once we have those supplies in a few weeks. Thank you, Jeff. I'd like to ask any of the physicians, uh, we've been hearing questions about why preventative measures are, are being lifted across the country. And even as cases remain high and variants spread. Uh, I've seen on the news tonight, I saw where spring break and people go into beaches and people go into some motorcycle event somewhere and uh, a lot of uh, activity. It, it's kind of scary to me to see it. And they say it's that scary. all spread. What measures do you think should be in place at this stage uh, as places like Texas, Mississippi, and Wyoming are totally lifting the mask requirements for everybody? So, I wouldn't go to Texas or Wyoming right now. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing you can say is, I mean, just because people are doing something stupid doesn't mean you need to do something stupid also. And we know that lifting a mask ordinance right now is absolutely the wrong thing to do. I mean, you can look at Dr. Jane and Dr. Hilberth and everybody else on the call shaking their head to that. It's crazy to be doing that. Don't go there for your vacation would be my recommendation. So Congressman, I want to take a second and talk about what Dr. Warren has said is uh, the masking. Let's take that for example. It is really premature to call victory against uh, COVID-19. It's imagine a football game. It's the fourth quarter and things are going well, and all of a sudden you say, oh, don't worry, We're, it, everything is hunky-dory, we're going to win this game. No way. This virus is very stealthy. It finds a way to, uh, to get at us, and it has done it again and again, wave by wave. What we do know that the masking really works, how much? Actually, threefold reduction in chances of getting an infection. Just imagine that. And we know that double masking works as well. So studies have been done that your exposure, if someone is wearing a mask and someone else is coughing, you get about 7% exposure. However, if both individuals are double masked, your exposure is reduced by 94%. I mean, just imagine uh, the virus just cannot travel through those two masks. So those preventive measures really play a key part in allowing us not to let the virus spread. Dr. Chan, every 
a lot of people have masks now that have messages on them. I've got a grizzly mask. I've got an NIH mask. I've got a, you know, different. Should you, for most effectiveness, wear the blue pleated mask inside or the outside? So uh, what I do is I wear that. uh, So the surgical mask is what I put on first, and then the cloth mask or the decorative mask can be on on top, and then you can take that and wash it. And the surgical mask, you know, uh, if it gets soiled or after a while it, it's wet, you can put on another one. So that's really the way I, I do things. And uh, double masking is a good idea. Dr. Hill, you have, what's your reaction to all these people acting like victory has won and we're at the VC day? So let me just make it really plain. In my opinion, it's almost criminal to lift restrictions when we're so close to the finish line. Anybody who now gets infected with uh, COVID, with SARS-CoV-2, when their lives could have been saved by vaccination, but we lifted the mandates and we lifted the restrictions. To me, it's, it's, it's boring on criminal uh, because we're so close to getting this behind us. Anyone who now gets infected and dies, as far as I'm concerned, is a totally unnecessary death. And if the leaders don't understand this, uh, then, you know, <laughs> that's a serious problem for me. Uh, because honestly, we're so close. By the end of May, we could have most of the adults in the country immunized and we could achieve almost herd immunity status. Uh, and to, 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 to let up now is just the wrong thing to do. It's just a really, really bad decision. Uh, Back, and- how about the people that are vaccinated now? Let's say you've got a couple and they're both vaccinated. What precaution should they continue to take even though they've, they've been vaccinated? And, and what research is there about the spread, uh, the capacity to spread the virus if you have been vaccinated? So Congressman, as you know, the CDC today made a recommendation that if you're fully vaccinated, it is okay for you to go to a restaurant and have dinner as long as you're with people who are vaccinated. Uh, it's probably safe to, in your house, in your own pod, so to speak, to not wear a mask. But even the people who are vaccinated, when they're out in the public with folks that you don't know their vaccination status, it is still a wise thing to do to wear the mask and here's why. The vaccine trials were designed to answer a very specific question, not whether they protect you from infection, but do they protect you from disease? So it's it's possible for a vaccinated person to have an asymptomatic infection and pass the virus on to others, even though they've been protected. So until we have definitive proof that the vaccines block infection, it is wise for all of us to continue to wear the mask until we achieve herd immunity. And that's why that recommendation has been made because the vaccines protect against disease. We don't know they protect against infection. Thank you, doctor. I'm gonna bring it back locally to our Shelby County uh, physicians, Dr. Jane and Dr. Warren. Since Shelby County schools have reopened, some parents are eager to know how this could be done safely if not everyone is vaccinated. Do you feel it's safe for kids to go back to school? Jeff Warren, you are a school board member. Uh, What do you think? You know, when this first hit, we didn't know exactly how it spread. We were thinking the spread was a lot like influenza. Um, And with that, we know that children uh, are the ones that tend to spread influenza. But now we know with COVID, SARS, you know, Two, this is not spread by children. It's spread by older people to older people. So I think that in and of itself gives you a little bit of, uh, I guess, lack of, it makes you feel like you don't have to worry as much if you're a parent. Uh, Now, if you're a teacher and you're you're worried about whether you're going to get it, the good news is we've actually got vaccinations going out to teachers and they're getting them now. So that's good. Uh, I'm glad to see that. Um, We do know that if we practice social distancing and people wear masks, we can keep levels in schools low. We've seen that from some of the private schools in Shelby County have been able to do that. Uh, It's not 100 percent, but, you know, the fact that our kids have been falling behind and they need the socialization of being in school and they need their education, I think we can safely do that now with where the vaccinations are at present in our community. Uh, we just need to make sure that we tell our kids when they're in schools, wear your mask, 
uh, and, you know, back our teachers up when they're telling you your kid needs to wear his mask better. You need to talk to him when he comes home tonight. Dr. J, can you yeah. add to that? Yeah, I, I would. Uh, I, I would say uh, I believe it is uh, uh, okay, it's a good idea to send our children back to school. And I say that for many reasons Dr. Warren has talked about uh, in terms of the benefit of in-person schooling. Uh, but also we have to think about this. The virus really doesn't cause severe disease in children. One of the major concerns was that it causes and children will bring the disease back home to their parents and grandparents who are elderly and then they will get sick and we know that they have a much higher mortality rate. Well, guess what? Our, the parents and grandparents in large part are vaccinated and so they're protected. And so it's really important to know that that level of concern is really reduced. And children, if they're masking and they're distancing, like many of the schools have shown uh, and studies have been done in UT and other places, that's very effective in uh, able to keep the infection down and the kids to be together. As for the question earlier about gathering um, and vaccine, so I'll say this, after a year, this past weekend, um, I got together with my uncle and aunt uh, here in, in Germantown. Uh, it took a whole year us to get there. They were vaccinated, we were all vaccinated, and we got together for a dinner. And I would say that to uh, all others, get vaccinated and get together with family and friends. And then it's two weeks after your second shot that you're fully vaccinated. Is that correct? Two correct? weeks after the, the shot. Let me yeah. ask this lightning round. Steve, it's not the second shot. It's two weeks after the first shot, you're immune. The second shot is the one that makes it last longer into the future. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, lightning round question, which is from Quizm on the Air, I guess. Uh, are vaccines safe for people with allergies to food or medicine? Jeff, you want to take that? Yes, the answer is yes. Yes, they are. I mean, you know, if you've had a major allergic reaction, like Dr. Hildred said, uh, make sure you get your vaccine in a hospital setting because you could have a major reaction to it. Doesn't mean you're going to, but those are the only people that we're really worried about are people who've got a history of an act, a reaction to a vaccine in the past. And what about nursing or pregnant mothers, Dr. Jane? So right now, all the studies have not been done, but generally, yes. Uh, almost all of the individuals from the scientific community are saying uh, that it's a good idea. And also, if we look at the clinical trials that were done, they were not done for pregnant women or nursing mothers, but those who were pre got pregnant, it was safe. And so the answer is, it is uh, safe, uh, and we will know more from clinical trials. My daughter-in-law uh, is due to have a baby in April and she has been vaccinated. Good job. Dr. Hildreth, how long will the vaccine work and for how, and how frequently will people need to get it or a booster? I guess we really don't know that quite yet. So Congressman, we don't know the answer to that, but I can let you know that the trials are planned to last for more than two years. So the vaccine trial participants will be followed for two years to monitor safety, uh, extended periods of time, but also to look for lasting immunity. So we'll have those answers as the trial concludes in a couple of years. Thank you. For closing questions, Ms. Collins, uh, how, many, how many vaccines have been administered in Memphis and Shelby counties? And is there anything uh, else that you'd like to add? So we have had 179 first and second round doses in Shelby County, of which a little bit over 47,000 have been under the city of Memphis leadership, which was um, about a week and a half ago. I think what is important to know is that this is a long road. Um, I think everyone within city leadership is extremely aware of what needs to be done to make sure that everyone can get vaccinated, to make sure that there is not a bunch of misinformation, that people are clear um, and vaccine is accessible. I agree with everyone. The goal is to get everyone who wants to be and who is able to be vaccinated, vaccinated by the end of May. And I think we can do that as long as we get the support from the state, our ongoing allocation, and with our community partners. Thank you. Dr. Webb Hooper, what else would you say to uh, vaccine hesitant people, particularly with 
that community specifically about getting vaccinated? Sure. So, you know, first thing, the first thing I would say is, listen, I hear you. I see you. I feel you on this. I acknowledge that because of our history and our recent experiences and those that the vicarious experiences that we um, we feel through our family members and our friends and our community overall, we are fully justified to be skeptical and have distrust. Um, and I think, though, also that our people, we know our community and our, our lives, our livelihoods, because there are also significant you know, economic effects of COVID that also have, has a disproportionate impact on communities of color and African-Americans in particular. And so having three effective vaccines in less than a year's time um, or about a year is really nothing short of miraculous. And you know, the country is in crisis. We, you know, this pandemic is ending the lives of African Americans at a rate of one in 1,000. So we can't afford to be left behind. Um, and we all want to end this pandemic as soon as possible. So widespread acceptance of these vaccines across all populations is really critical. And the initial data being reported um, for the states that are reporting it um, show that we are. Um, not being vaccinated as African-Americans at the rate that we should, given our proportion in the population. And that's something that we're monitoring very closely. Um, and so I also just echo everyone else in encouraging you to really seriously um, think about um, becoming vaccinated as soon as you're eligible. Ms. Collins in Memphis, do the community health centers, uh, particularly Memphis Community Health Center and others, uh, have the vaccine and able to distribute it? Yes. So some of the community clinics get their allocation directly from the state. We also have appropriation meetings where we speak to those clinics and we ask, what is your bandwidth? How much more would you like and how much more would you take? And they can tell us that we have the ability to vaccinate X amount of people over and beyond our current allocation. So we're doing that on a weekly basis. Uh, I think particularly like Christ Community, they're vaccinating through their current um, patient List So they're reaching out to their patients in those communities, from Hickory Hill to Frazier um, to South Memphis and saying, come get your vaccine where you've gotten your regular normal care. And those are safe spaces. And we'll continue to work with those, um, those clinics, Christ Community, Church Health, and so on to make sure that their patients who are comfortable with their care can get um, the service they need where it's accessible to them. Will there be plans, Ms. Collins, to go to high-rise senior uh, apartments uh, to, to reach low-income and disabled populations? Yes, sir. There is um, the understanding that we need to coordinate with Memphis Housing Authority to make sure that those populations of individuals um, get the care they need if they have not had an opportunity to get vaccinated. Thank you. Now, I don't know who would know the answer to this, but who knows with the timetable on the J&J &J population coming to Memphis on the J&J &J vaccine, and getting that uh, in distribution. Ms. Collins, you're smiling. Does that mean you know the answer? I don't exactly know the answer. I do, under I do understand that the state is, and I think that this is probably across the board, the J&J &J vaccine is probably the best use for individuals that would be difficult to get them with a second dose. So for pop-up pods where you have to have a certain amount of infrastructure or for um, transient populations, or individuals who have transportation issues. So I'm pretty sure that that is probably um, the first group of people who should have the opportunity to get that vaccine. As of now, we, we don't have an allocation that we're gonna say in two weeks, the city is going to be vaccinated with J&J, &J, but I would hope that in, in the near future, the people who uh, would have the most access issues will get the opportunity to get the J&J &J vaccine first. Dr. Hilberth, is there anything such as a spoiled vaccine that could uh, uh, dis, dis, uh, uh, hurt, disable somebody or cause them any kind of problem? Uh, Congressman, I don't think the spoiled vaccine would do harm. The question is whether or not they would offer protection. So the concern is not whether a vaccine that's gone bad would do harm to a person. It's whether or not they would think that they're protected when in fact they're not because the vaccine was actually no good. So, uh, you know, and people should know that the mRNA vaccines disappear out of our systems very quickly. It, the mRNA goes into our cells, is not there for more than 24 hours. As a matter of fact, just a few hours. 
the protein itself that's encoded by the mRNA only lasts for a few days. So it's very unlikely that there'd be long-term consequences from these things sticking around in our system. So the concern about a, a, a ruined vaccine is not doing harm, but would it do us any good? And we're thinking we're vaccinated when we're not been because the vaccine was bad. And there's no way to tell if you got a, uh, a vaccine that maybe was, had been out, out of fridge frozen. Well, well, but the good news, Congressman, is that most of the folks who are doing this have strict protocols for handling the vaccines. And quite honestly, I was pleased to hear that people had owned up to the possibility of vaccines being ruined rather than trying to hide it and using those vaccines anyway. I'd much prefer that people acknowledge that there's a problem and hold those vaccines back rather than to cover it up and give the vaccines anyway. So that gave me some reassurance that things are working the way they should. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Warner or Ms. Collins. In Memphis, we have some vaccines that they said were possibly given, I think it was the, at one of the locations that might have been spoiled. Have we followed, found out the date and followed up with people to get them, make sure they're vaccinated? You know, Steve, I, I think that at our last Toby COVID task force, there had been an investigation into that and they felt like no one had received a vaccine that was out of date or invalid. Uh, and again, as Dr. Hilbert said, the worst case scenario is uh, you would have like a vaccine that wouldn't be effective. It wouldn't hurt you. And if you've already had your first dose of the vaccine, well, and it wasn't as good, the second dose should be okay. And, you know, I, I really think we're going to be seeing COVID boosters coming around every two or three years anyway. So um, I would not be excessively concerned about that because I do not believe we had uh, any or many of those cases uh, going on uh, from the best yeah. of what they've been able to tell us and, and on Cong the task force. Yeah, Congressman, if people are concerned, they can go to their doctor and they can get an antibody blood test drawn. Uh, and that will tell us that through antibodies that they have protection or not, did the vaccine work or not well. So uh, and they should do it in the first, what, one or two months, Minoj, before it goes so away? Yeah, well, they, they, they can do the early on within a month or two after they've got their dosing to get their antibodies checked if they're concerned. So uh, I want to reassure people, uh, as Dr. Hildreth said, uh, safety-wise, there's no need to worry uh, uh, with a spoiled uh, vaccine. Uh, and in terms of efficacy, does it work or not? Um, they can get antibodies checked and, and know that they're uh, protected. So... So there are options that are available. I had my shots and I didn't have any reaction to it or any adverse reaction. Some people are, are not sure. They say if they don't get aches and pains after they get their second shot, uh, was there something wrong with their second shot? Uh, what, what's, what's your response to that? No, they shouldn't worry, Congressman. In the, in the vaccine trials, all of them, there were large numbers of individuals who had soreness at the injection site and that was it. But they were part of the group that was protected. So we all have different reactions to things depending on our physiology and our immune system. So I shouldn't worry about that if I were you. Thank you. I didn't um, have any reaction either, Steve. Does anybody want to add anything before we close out? Any, any thoughts that you want to express to constituents? I just want to add to what others have said. We're so close to having this behind us. This is not the time to let up. In fact, we should be doubling down to not let another single person die from COVID-19 being so close to the finish. So I would just say, let's stick with it and do what we have to do to protect ourselves and our communities. Congressman, I'll add um, to what has been said is we've talked a great deal about vaccine, vaccination. We've talked a little bit about masking, really important what we also need to do is to continue the testing. Don't forget that we have to continue testing. Mild symptoms, moderate symptoms, anyone you've been in contact with who's positive, please get tested. That's critically important. So continue with what we're doing. Thank you, Dr. Jane. And I wanna thank each of our panelists for providing <laughs> valuable information that we've uh, been able to an and answer questions. I, I hope that you all found this town, that town hall to be very informative, I did, and helpful. If you want more information, visit my website at cohen.house.gov or call my office here in Memphis at 544-4131, 544-4131. Uh, please remember that we all have to do our part, wear our masks, 
make America healthy again, and please get your shot, socially distance, and wash your hands. Um, I had, when I was a child in 1954, uh, the sock vaccine was being given to second grade students in Memphis in the, in the spring. And my father was a pediatrician and he gave the shot to second graders, which included my middle brother uh, who got the shot. And my father gave him the shot at Ottawa School. He had some vaccine and he brought it home and he was going to give it to me. And he decided that it was wrong, that that was not within his charge as a physician uh, in this trial. And he did not give it to me. Uh, he thought, as I understand it, that if he gave me the shot, and there were a very minor number of people that got polio from the vaccine, because that was a live virus, unlike this one, he would never forgive himself. And in September, I got polio, and my father never forgave himself. Uh, vaccines are important, and I certainly wish I would have had the vaccine in the spring of 54, and I didn't get that opportunity. So that's why it's so important to me to urge each and every one of you, if you have a chance to get the vaccine, get it. Don't get ill, don't have the effects that people who get COVID have and the effects I had from polio. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate all of our experts. Uh, and if you need extra help, call us and we will provide it. Uh, I'm Steve Cohen and thank you so much. Mask up, make America healthy again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. You're very kind and you're, you're a pro. And we're, we're, we're lucky to have you in our state and, and particularly on this event tonight. And from the NIH, Dr. Webb Hooper, uh, thank you. And uh, we look forward to your promotion, Dr. Collins. <laughs> and, Ms. Collins and Ms. Collins, you've got a great job and, and keep us healthy here in Memphis. Thank you so much. Thanks, and everyone. Nice. Captain uh, Quentin, you aced it. <laughs>